From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. With responsibilities ranging from elections to tracking lobbyists and corporate filings, the Office of Secretary of State is an important corner of the State House that, frankly, few Rhode Islanders truly grasp. With current Secretary of State Ralph Mollis blocked by term limits, the next office holder will likely have to tackle the controversial voter ID law. Several candidates want to abolish it, including our guest on the first half of Newsmakers, Democratic candidate for Secretary of State, Guillaume de Rommel. Then, a bill being considered by lawmakers would permanently eliminate the tolls on the Sakonet River Bridge, but it has several moving parts that need to fall into place. It's an ambitious bill that would make major changes to how Rhode Island pays for bridges throughout the state. This week on Newsmakers, the bill's sponsor, State Representative Jay Edwards of Portsmouth. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Good morning, everyone, and Guillaume, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Our standard first question is, why do you want to be Secretary of State? Well, I love this state. I grew up uh, on Aquidneck Island where I live with my family, and uh, I've seen just too many missed opportunities. Um, I want to take my two decades of experience in the private sector, working throughout the country for big and small businesses, um, started a business in Rhode Island, and I can't tell you how incredibly hard and difficult it is to do business in this state. Uh, and I want to take that to the Secretary of State's office to really help uh, reshape the, the business climate here in Rhode Island. You know, I wanted to dive into uh, voter ID, and we're going to do that. But you said something in there that was kind of interesting to me. You said there were too many missed opportunities. Is that an assessment of Secretary of State Ralph Mollis? Not at all. Not at all. Actually, I think, um, you know, I ran against uh, in 06. Uh, Secretary Mollis eight years ago. It was a tight race. If it I was a very, right. very tight race. And um, I think he's done a fine job. He, um, he, I'd love to take what he's started, specifically focus on the, the, the first stop business center and make it the one and only stop business center. I can't tell you, my, I mean, my experience trying to navigate state government, um, we need to have a clear, predictable, and reliable path. Businesses need that. And uh, Ralph has done a really tremendous job on that first step, but I want to keep it keep it going. Before we get to voter ID, mm -hmm. Guillaume, um, you know, I do, I do our business show as well, and you don't hear people mention the Secretary of State's office <laughs> as the problem. You know, it's, it's things that come out of the General Assembly, it's deep in the DEM or something. I mean, I know you've talked a lot about cutting red tape, increasing transparency, but how much really can the Secretary of State do about the business climate in Rhode Island? Absolutely. If you look at, if you look at our state government, and taking the General Assembly aside, you have 42 state agencies, 21 quasi-public-private uh, corporations, 74 regulatory entities. Uh, for the average, you know, for the, for the small business, uh, mom and pop, uh, you know, which is the bulk of our economy, it's very, very difficult to navigate that. And constitutionally, the Secretary of State's office is the keeper of record. It's the first stop where everybody comes in, or sh should. Um, and that's where you can really help uh, people navigate that without an army of lawyers or a team of consultants or um, you know, a, a gang of lobbyists. You have to help uh, small businesses. All right, voter ID. You want to repeal it. Um, it passed with support from Democrats, signed by the governor, uh, had support from minority lawmakers. Nationally, Rhode Island has gotten positive uh, press for being a more thoughtful voter ID law. So why do you want to get rid of it? Look, as the chief elections officer, um, my, one of my top uh, priorities, as any Secretary of State uh, uh, priority, is to increase uh, voter, voter uh, participation and uh, civic, civic participation. That's critical. Um, I, I personally don't see, I see the, the, a need for it. Um, I think there's some other things that we really can champion, including uh, early voting, online voter registration. Those are the things I really want to champion as uh, Red Island's next Secretary of yeah, State. But just to keep on this, a lot of people think, look, when I go to Walmart or Target or something and I put my credit card down, I got to put my license out for that. So why should voting be less secure Didn't than buying the Target, though? The, yeah, right, Target. Yeah, right. <laughs> but um, than buying a you know a product at a store. Well, you know, buying a product at a store is not a fundamental right. Uh, people have fought and died for that right to vote. And uh, frankly, voting. So shouldn't it be more secure then if well, people no, have fought if, and died? If, if, we, if, if we want to secure our election system, I think there's other ways to do it, including, for example, looking at the Central Voter Registry, which is, uh, is something that I'd love to really look at, and having that coordinated with, for example, uh, I mean, both internally inside the state, talking to the DMV, 
to Department of Health, vital records. I mean, we should be looking at those uh, issues to look at, gee, is there duplication of uh, uh, voter rolls, things like that. But I, I, I just don't see the numbers of voter fraud through voter ID or, you know, without the duplication. As a matter of fact... So you want to see a problem before you protect it? Absolutely. We need to document this. This is, this is a, a paramount to our, uh, I mean, to, to our election system. By the way, if you look at our, my 2006 uh, election, look, I, don't ha I have a, a complicated name. It's not Tim White. <laughs> and if you look at, uh, if, at that race, my name's on the ballot. But my, my vote never appeared on the, uh, as having been cast because I had to cast a provisional ballot because they couldn't find my name on the, uh, on the voter roll. Look, that can happen, and it does happen. And unless, uh, unless we really take a close look at that, it's going to continue to happen. One of the jobs of the Secretary of State is to manage, you've kind of indicated this, lobbyists and uh, records on those kind of things. A couple years ago, um, I reached out to Secretary of State Mollis' office to ask why Kurt Schilling didn't have to register as a lobbyist when he was going to the EDC begging for loan guarantees. We know he got a lot of money and we know how all that's gone. Um, and Secretary of State Mollis said he didn't think he, Schilling needed to register despite all that effort with, uh, with uh, 38 Studios and state government. Do you agree that, that someone even doing as much as Kurt Schilling did is not covered by, by needing to register with the Secretary of State's office? I, I'm not uh, familiar with that particular instance, but uh, certainly that's, that's a key aspect uh, and responsibility of the Secretary of State's office, the lobbyist, uh, uh, and making sure that not only are people properly registered, but also that that information makes sense, uh, that, it, that it really becomes uh, more open, transparent, and accessible. That's key. Um, but knowing, knowing what Schilling, the meetings, he, the people he was meeting with, the amount of money he wound up getting out of the state, or at least loan guarantee initially, I mean, is, is that lobbying or not, in your view? I, again, I'm, I'm not exactly specifically uh, familiar with that instance, but no doubt if, if, if people are getting, uh, especially at that level of funds from the state, uh, public needs to know. It goes back to open, transparent, accessible government. I wanted to do a little rapid-fire section here. A couple of them you rattled off early. You support online voter registration, you said, correct? Yes, okay. absolutely. So, so a couple of yes or no's here, just so we can hit a, a few topics fast. Um, early in-person voting? Yes. Uh, Same-day registration? Yes. Do you support elimination of the master lever? Yes. All right. And uh, give me a letter grade, if you would, for current Secretary of State Ralph Mollis. Look, I'm a terrible grader. Uh, but like I said, uh, I, I think Secretary Mollis has done a fine job, and I look forward to expanding on his good work, um, and specifically, again, on how to get Rhode Islanders back to work. What would you do differently from Ralph Mollis? Um, my focus is going to be on how to, get, how to get Rhode Islanders back to work. How can we improve the business climate here? I mentioned the 42 state agencies, 21 quasi-public-private uh, corporations, 74 regulatory entities. How do we make our state government more accessible, more open, more transparent? You said a quick yes on eliminating the master lever. How strongly do you feel about it? I mean, would you be up there uh, at you know, the state house really pushing to make sure it goes away, or is it just something you say on this program during the campaign? Look, it's, it's time to get rid of it, but my focus again, and as... Why, it, why should we get rid of it? Well, it, it, for example, in, 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 in Newport, we don't, we don't have a partisan election. We, we have a city council school committee run on a nonpartisan basis. There's some complications with that. Uh, and, and frankly, I'd love to look at a new voter uh, uh, election system. When Jimmy Langevin was Secretary of State, he brought in uh, uh, the system that we have now. I think we need to look at new technology um, to really help improve. And one of the things that we can do is really uh, looking at some of the electronic uh, voting machines to help uh, solve some of the problems that the master lever uh, actually uh, brings. You know, we had some uh, messes in election oversight or administration last year, or two years ago now in 2012 in Rhode Island. The, there was a lack of ballots in some polling places. There was confusion about changes in polling places, the timing. Um, uh, what do you think went wrong, if you think anything went wrong, in how the 2012 election was administered? What, as Secretary of State, would you do to try to make things go more smoothly in election time? There's no doubt. Well, there, there's, there's a number of uh, issues that came up in uh, that election including uh, downsizing the polling locations. One thing that I know we have to uh, do is actually uh, have a, a better line of communication between the Secretary of State's office and the Board of Elections. I talked about that in 2006, but that's something that's absolutely critical to have is the Secretary of State's office uh, somehow involved, whether it is seated at seat at the table, at the Board of Elections, uh, to increase that, uh, that dialogue. Because people at home might not realize the Secretary of State doesn't control the Board of Elections. It's an independent entity. We had Bob Kando on after that election who, who runs it right now. 
Right. That, that, that election, I mean, really, uh, there's a number of things. Look, we, I mean, there was uh, three page ballots, uh, but there's some common sense uh, things that we really need to look at. Perhaps having those, uh, those ballots uh, handed out in line so people can review while they're waiting. Also, it'd be great to have early voting. I've talked about early, early voting, increasing uh, voter. As a matter of fact, it's worked so well in some states, North Carolina, Florida, that we've seen some Republican governors actually scale it back. You know, we, uh, frankly, the Secretary of State's office is not one that uh, voters grasp. It can be kind of obscure, and often they don't know who they're going to vote for until they walk into the booth that day, which is why we like um, having you on the show. We had Nellie Gorbia, your opponent, uh, on the show a while back. i got to tell you, sitting here and listening to you, I don't hear a lot of big differences between you and Nellie. What are the stark differences? Why should someone vote for you over her? I'll tell you, I mean, if, if you take my two decades of experience in the private sector working um, it, it, it's starting a business here in Rhode Island and understand I'm the only candidate in this race who has that experience, that firsthand knowledge of, uh, of how, to, how difficult it is to, uh, to not only run a business but to start one here in Rhode Island. Why don't you tell people what your business was if they don't know who you are? Oh, no, no, I've had several. Actually, my background has been in, uh, in commercial real estate. Um, and but then I've, I've, I've started several businesses, including actually a small uh, air charter with my twin brother um, in, in Newport. And uh, I've built, uh, I've done a lot of construction in uh, Newport, um, including a project on state property, which, which took a lot of time and, uh, and effort. You know, fundraising for these um, down ballot offices can be very difficult. Um, you're a wealthy guy, and you can pour some of your own personal money into this. Your opponent can't do that. Is it fair? Look, I know, I mean, it, it, it's very challenging to run a statewide race, but you have to get your message out there. I'm doing this because I care about the state. I love this state. And I want to create more opportunities. I've seen too many just go by. Um, and I want to take, again, my, my experience to help Rhode Islanders get back to work. I'm curious, you know, uh, you ran in 06, as we said, very close race. You've, you've never uh, shied away from saying you, you know which towns you lost in and everything else. But what are you doing differently this time? What did you learn from that? What's the biggest difference between your 06 campaign? This is just a politics question. What's the biggest thing you learned that you're really applying in 2014 to make this? I assume you want it to go differently in the end. Well, you, that was my first, uh, first time out running. Um, I've, I certainly learned a lot. I'm overwhelmed by the support that we're getting now. Um, I actually pleased to, uh, to announce that we had uh, the endorsement of both uh, North Providence Mayor Lombardi and uh, Johnston Mayor Paul Cena and the town committee in Johnston. Those two communities unfortunately didn't do too well uh, last time, but it's just... Two mayors who won't be shy if they have advice for you. On <laughs> yeah, the which right. is great. It's great to have uh, their support and, uh, and, and really, I mean, across the board, it's just uh, the, the, the contrast between then and now. And it, as you said, I did very, very well, uh, got 47 percent of the vote in 2006. but. I, I, I'm just overwhelmed by the, the support we're getting now. Real quick, did, are you going to support anyone for governor pre-primary? Look, I know exactly. I mean, it, it's, it's incredible how much uh, effort. It's a full-time job running uh, for statewide office. So you're I'm playing focused on safe. my race. <laughs> I'm focused you're on my safe. race. Well, look, and I'll support uh, whoever the Democratic nominee is. Okay. And i, I got to ask you a personal question. Please. How, how hard was it growing up? with a first name like Guillaume. It's, it's unique, <laughs> right? <laughs> it is, it is. It, it, it is tough. And, is you it know, a family uh, name? Where did that come from? Well, it's William. In, uh, right. In, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, somehow I get stuck with that, that name. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly, uh, hopefully, once people uh, invest the, uh, the effort into uh, knowing the name, um, they'll remember it. But yeah, it's, it, it's certainly not, uh, not a simple uh, name to, to <laughs> say. Guillaume de Rommel, he's Democratic candidate for Secretary of State. Thank you very much for joining us on the program. Thanks for having me. Great well, to be here. When we come back, we're going to explore eliminating a bill is exploring eliminating the tolls on the Sakonet River Bridge. Our guest is Portmus, uh, Portsmouth State Rep Jay Edwards. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. And our guest for the second half of the program is State Representative Jay Edwards. He represents uh, Portsmouth and Tiverton. He's also the Senior Deputy Majority Leader. And I, I want to point out, your actual first name is John, but we talked before the show, you like Jay. My constituents all know me as Jay. All right, so Jay Edwards it is. Um, so here's a shocker. A uh, lawmaker from Portsmouth wants to do and away... Tiverton. And Tiverton. <laughs> wants to do away with the Sakonet tolls. Explain the bill. Well, the bill is actually a lot more than just the uh, removal of the, of the tolls for the bridge. The bridge, the, the infrastructure bill is all-encompassing. It's probably one of the most bold 
uh, piece of legislation that have come out of the General Assembly in a long time because it takes a 10-year look at fixing our infrastructure. Director Lewis, to throw out the entire commission That's um, Department of Transportation Director Michael Lewis. Yes, RIDOT Director My Michael Lewis. He told us he needed a billion dollars to basically bring our infrastructure back into repair. We ha accepted that challenge and we came up with a bill where we can, over the course of 10 years, bring a million dollars of our own money back into our infrastructure. We're basically redoing it ourselves. Rhode Island is a small state, as we all know. This is one of the few times where our, our small size is an advantage, because where else could you do this? Where else could a state finance their own infrastructure program to bring all of their roads and bridges back into repair? And how are you going to finance it? How are you paying for it? There are multiple um, items, but the, the two big ones are, first, we have right now um, all the departments across the state are only allowed to spend 97% of their budget. This is the general fund. We are every year going to cap them a quarter percent, accumulating to another qu uh, point and a half. That will, over the course of 10 years, every year after the sixth year, will bring the Rhode Island uh, Turnpike and Bridge Authority, no, sorry, the Rhode Island DOT, Fifty-two and a half million dollars. Let's just so when you say you're going to cap them, you're going to cut their budget by a percent and a half. No, a percent and a half after six years, a quarter percent every year up to six yeah, years. Yeah, but so eventually it's not, it'll be a percent and a half after six years. That's you're, and, and it's another way to put it again is you're cutting their budget. That's right. What's the impact of that? Have you looked at it? Um, well, we're doing it a quarter percent every year, so it's not a shock to the system. If a, if a department can't cut their own budget by a quarter percent every year and look forward to it, then they are not doing a good enough job. And if, if it, it's accumulating. So that after the six years, they have, they have a full point and a half. But up until then, it's, it accumulates a quarter percent every year. It's not a big cut. Um, so I was looking, I, I thought it was, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong, I thought it ended up being 2.5% of the general fund will end up in this new infrastructure trust fund. Is that incorrect? No, a point and a half. Uh, just a point the and a half. Other, the other, the other uh, three points. A point and a half goes to our rainy day fund. The other point goes to the other point and a half goes to right cap. Right. This is, it's basically a cap on how a state can't spend every dime that comes in the door every year. Exactly. We're, we're putting it in different places. Um, you're talking about quite a bit of money, though. I mean, we're talking. You said just fifty million dollars there out of the state budget. We're looking at deficits going out. Tim's been doing a lot of reporting on the casinos coming mm -hmm. in and the impact of that will have. I mean. Um, do you really think it's feasible to take that much money out of what's come in? We're already looking at shortfalls in the years to come. I don't think it's not only feasible, I think it's absolutely necessary. Our infrastructure right now is the most important asset we have. Everyone says our children are our most important assets. They're our children. They're not owned by us. <laughs> our roads and bridges are owned by the entire state. And if we don't do something now, we are going to have a huge problem. It could be two years, three years from now, but we're going to have a problem that we're not going to be able to dig ourselves out of. We have neglected our infrastructure for so long that right now we are at a point where it's a crisis. And if we don't address it, it will become even worse, and we could have a catastrophe. In this I state. can hear other lawmakers in their heads saying, Jay makes, Jay makes a good pitch that this is a transportation statewide thing, but mm -hmm. it's really to bail out the East Bay lawmakers so there's no toll on the Sakon at River Bridge. Why am I ever going to vote for a bill that raises DMV fees? I know temporarily, but raises mm -hmm. DMV fees on my residents and, and leads to cuts in state services so they don't have to pay a toll on a bridge most of my constituents will never drive over. Actually, everyone in the state drives over state roads at some point, and that's what this whole thing is aimed at. The taking away of the tolls in Scott River Bridge is only a very small portion of this bill. You keep saying that, but I mean, can, can we be serious for a second? Mm -hmm. Would you have ever explored this bill <laughs> if the Sakonet River Bridge tolls weren't a part of it? Probably not. Okay. And that, that is actually a good thing. When we first started on the commission in September last year, I thought long and hard how we were going to achieve this, to this, this goal of fixing our entire state's infrastructure, and I was afraid because I really didn't have a clue. And over the course of the six months that we met, we listened, we heard, we heard about other states, um, the way that other states are doing it, and we came up with a formula that we think is achievable. And it's not perfect, but our colleagues now have something to discuss as a statewide issue because it is a completely statewide problem. You know, and to, to come off of Ted's question about how you sell this thing, one of the elements to your bill is you're going to keep uh, the tolls on the, the Newport Bridge up mm -hmm. and running. How, how fair is that to them? I mean, here's something that isn't going to 
to change. The tolls are going to be there. It's the only dedicated source of revenue that you could essentially guarantee in this. So that's a code for it's going to go up and up. So what do you say to the people of Newport? Well, actually, we looked at having it not going up and up. To have the infrastructure fund help that if they needed more money, if let's say they, they need to go up a dollar, the infrastructure fund will, will provide more money for them to keep the toll that's currently on the, uh, the Pell Bridge where it is right now. That's one of the tenants. But why do they put. have to pay a toll at all if Sakana at River Bridge doesn't need a toll? Because we couldn't figure out a way to get away from the, the $180 million that the, that's brought in. $18 million a year is brought in on the Pell. We couldn't get away from that, those, those funds. I mean, they're necessary right now. Hopefully, uh, over the course of time, you know, if our, our economy comes back and we can find more money, hopefully we can get them off. But for the, the interim, the 10 year period, we don't see that happening. And we tried to be realistic about the bridge. I remember last year I was there reporting in the House the night of the budget vote. And um, you looked as happy as the Cheshire cat when they <laughs> came out from the back room and said, we have a deal, no tolls in the Sakonet, we're going to put it in the budget. Um, East Bay lawmakers were thrilled, very excited. You, you particularly, you were on TV that night talking about it. Um, Mike Lewis that night warned, you know, this isn't going to work because we need the money off the Sakonet to pay some bonds. A week later, y and you looked as angry as you'd look happy a week earlier. They come back, they say, yeah, we do have to put the toll on the Sakonet River, which is a sudden bill passed, it goes through. I mean, were you, were you East Bay lawmakers hoodwinked that night in the budget so Gordon Fox could pass the 38 Studios bond payment? No, I don't believe so at all. I mean, I dealt with the Speaker a lot on this particular issue, and I don't think anyone threw us under the bus. I think what happened here was Mike Lewis laid out very clearly that he had to have a toll on the bridge before they achieve substantial completion. Now, we've asked Director Lewis a number of times, has the bridge been substantially complete? Still not. He said he was going to be achieve substantial completion as early as August 23rd. That's why the date of August 19th, the toll had to go on. They still haven't achieved substantial completion. Here we are, it's March. The end date is coming up, April 1st. They, I don't believe they're going to achieve substantial completion before that date. I believe they actually achieved substantial completion in, in September of 2012 when they let traffic open up on both sides. How so I, I think the, the Portsmouth case, court case that they have, I think that after yeah, we, we should we, point out there's a federal lawsuit by your town that is mm -hmm. you know kind of working in, in concert. Do you, how, judge, are you are you confident that that's going to pass? Um, well, I think the judge right now, the federal judge, has put it off. He suspended the case pending what the General Assembly does. All right. But that night, Rep, you had leverage. Gordon Fox was scared to death that they weren't going to be able to pass that 38 Studios bill, and it's one of the only times of the year, the budget, when you need, I think, 50 reps to say mm -hmm. yes to the budget, and they, they put the toll thing in for you guys, and then a week later, it's gone. I mean, did you, did you get mad at anybody? Did anyone hear it from you that you, you, you look silly in front of your constituents? I mean, that was, that was a pretty shocking turn of events. The way you look at it is, in the long term, we have a 10 cent toll on the Scott River Bridge. We were given almost another, like another nine months to come up with a solution. Both of them have been successful. They got their 10 cent toll, which has not been crippling to my, the economy in our area. People have barely even noticed it. And number two, we have come up with a solution, we think, for the entire state's infrastructure. And that's what this toll question has really achieved. So how hard are you going to fight for it this time? Are you going to refuse to Tooth vote for nail. the budget? Are you going to refuse to vote for the budget? Are you going to refuse to vote for the 38 Studios bond payment? I'm going to do whatever I have to do for my constituents in the East Bay. Does that mean you will buck you leadership? Not, you would buck leadership? You're well, a member of I'm, leadership. I'm in leadership. So, <laughs> but I also have the ability to speak to the speaker and the leader all the time. We have some support, as you noticed, from the, the bill I put in to, to move the date from April 1st to July 1st. I had the entire leadership team, except the speaker, sign on to that bill. The speaker rarely signs on to bills. All right, let me ask you a couple of quick questions about the, specifically the Rhode Island Bridge and Turnpike Authority. How do you think Dave Darlington is doing as chairman? Um, I think there are areas in the Turnpike and Bridge Authority that could be improved. I think they are a quasi. I think they've gone um, a little astray. I think they spend money in areas where they shouldn't be. So you don't think it's lean and mean? No, I do not. Where have they uh, misspent money? Uh, well, they spent $12,000 for uh, septic toilets on the... Um, when they had uh, tall ships come. The Port of John thing. Port of John's, yes. They had, uh, they, they've spent money on fireworks in Newport, and there is a whole host of other things. So they, should, should Dave Darlington go? If, you, if your bill doesn't pass, and it, which would put the, the Turnpike and Bridge Authority under the umbrella of the Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. correct? If that doesn't happen, should, do you, you feel strongly enough that Darlington should be out as chairman? I have another bill in play which would change the entire board makeup to uh, the elected officials from the towns that are actually directly affected by the bridges. 
And that would, inf do you think that would then do what I'm asking you? That I, would change the leadership? At I the think it would. Because the people who would be on the board then would be responsive to the people who are actually using and affected by the bridges. Very briefly, a right. totally different topic. What do you think of the pension settlement? It's a hot topic up there. Uh, I, I think that what's going to happen is there's a lot of water to go underneath the bridge before it comes to us. I am not positive it will ever make to the General Assembly. Um, I think if it does come, uh, we'll deal with it then. You don't sound like you're definitely supporting it by any means. Um, I will take a look at what comes and when it comes. <laughs> All right, State Representative <laughs> Jay Edwards representing Portsmouth and Tiverton. Uh, thank you very much for being our guest this week. Thank you for having uh, me. Real quick, it's in the House Finance. Is there a hearing set? No, we're trying to get the, uh, the, delay, bill, the, the, the delay date up first because that's actually more critical. Um, this bill can follow any time after. Okay, for Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmakers.